right, we're going to begin. We're going to go back to Wordsworth, whom we were looking at last class. We looked at Tintern Abbey, which uh, is one of his lyrical ballads and I think is very helpful for observing uh, the process whereby um, in Wordsworth's reckoning, the fall happens, uh, but also the means whereby we can be born again and the way in which thereby um, he proposes a new way of approaching the world should be um, followed and a movement of human society against the Enlightenment's uh, rationalization and uh, its uh, commodification of all life and its reductionism to just the mere material physical world and its exploitation of nature and its regarding of uh, human beings as so much property and so forth, like we saw in Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, right? So Wordsworth is, wants a, a, a response to that, and he does through it through a spiritual approach. He sa senses a spirit in himself, in nature, uh, and it's there almost in the background. I talked about that, how he uses uh, his poetry to draw the reader into perceiving something that he, he or she can't perceive. So there's a, he, references to silence, to the, uh, the ideas that go behind the words, and even a sense of, of, of a deeper uh, inclusion than we normally think of by these terms. So it's, it's pulling us in and helping us or trying to convince us to see something that we simply can't see. Uh, and he sees that particularly in the presence of nature. It's not there in the cities. The cities have, are, are noisy and loud and, as we've seen already or I've suggested, um, marked by civilization. And civilization is actually a sign of the fall, just like Blake did in his London. It's marked by chartered streets and the mine-forged manacles, which he hears everywhere. Uh, Wordsworth likewise sees a sort of a renovation possibility in uh, the innocence of the natural world, but the paradox is that we can't just go back to the beginning. We can't just, you know, down tools, get rid of uh, all manner of uh, technology or innovation and, and go back to nature, you know, take our clothes off and run outside and there we go, well, everything will be fine. He's not so naive about that and he doesn't propose that either. It's not going back to nature in that sense. It's going back to nature in an imaginative fashion, con contemplating on what nature means is what he means. And that's through the act of the imagination. And the poet will lead us in this then. An imaginative recovery of lost innocence, which is a part of himself. And it's the best part of himself. It's the part that's not civilized. And that nature which he sees in himself and sees in the world around him, he proposes as a means of a, a religious movement. The question is, and I already answered the question, whether this is Christian or not. And I suggested it's not. It's, it's pantheism or panentheism. There's, a, there's God in everything. It's in him, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the trees, it's, it's everywhere. It's all inclusive. Everything's, God is in everything. It sounds very affirmative. It sounds very positive. What does it entail, though? We're going to go to C.S. Lewis on this. I think he is, is helpful. This is from his book, uh, Mere Christianity, book two, What Christians Believe. He starts talking here. I don't know if you've read this or not, um, but he's helpful on this point. Uh, let me blow this up a little bit so you can actually see it. Um, he addresses, first of all, I'm going to skip over this because it's irrelevant to the case, atheism. Rival con there are those that are atheists. He regards them as not really a, uh, worthy of consideration. Not even worthy of consideration. They're not particularly um, um, interesting. Their arguments are not particularly powerful, and there aren't that many of them. There are more in our day but I've noticed that their arguments are often so appallingly bad and weak 
that you wonder uh, how this came about other than the general degeneration of intellect which we see all around us. But Lewis is dealing with another group. Uh, those who believe in God can be divided according to the sort of God they believe in. And this is the point here, because Wordsworth does believe in God. Even uh, sometimes calls God, God. But he's also associated God with all of these other things, with pretty much everything for that matter. So he, Lewis observes there are two very different ideas on this subject. One of them is the idea that he is beyond good and evil. He's beyond all categories of good and evil. Nietzsche, that's Nietzsche's phrase, right? We humans call one thing good and another thing bad. But according to some people, that's merely our human point of view. These people would say that the wiser you become, the less you would want to call anything good or, or bad. And the more dearly you would see uh, that everything is good in one way and bad in another, and that nothing could have been different. Consequently, these people think that long before we get anywhere near the divine point of view, the distinction between good and bad is gone. The closer we get to God, the more we can see that the, that the distinctions over which, let's say, wars are fought, this is good, this is bad, they're good, they're evil. If we come closer to a divine point of view, we're not going to appeal to those things at all. We'll just see the unity of all things. And that's what Wordsworth is leaning towards, right? And it's very much the spirit of our age as well. And that's on point here. So, consequently, these people think that long before you've got anywhere near the divine point of view, the distinction would have disappeared altogether. We call a cancer bad, they would say, because it kills a man. But you might just as well call a successful surgeon bad because he kills a cancer. It all depends on the point of view. The other and the opposite side idea is that God is quite definitely good or righteous, a God who takes sides, who loves love and hates hatred, who wants us to behave in one way and not in another. The first of the views, the one that he says in which good and evil are a matter of your perspective, is what we call pantheism. That's Wordsworth's view. It's a variation on it. It's called panentheism but still more or less in that position. It's held by the great Prussian philosopher Hegel and as far as I can understand them by the Hindus. See, so there are a million gods in Hinduism. Everything can be divinized. And that's because everything is um, a manifestation of godness. Whether we call it good or evil, that's a matter of perspective anyway. The other is the notion of God that he says is held by the Jews, the Mohammedans, and the Christians. The Mohammedans, uh, his phrase for the Muslims. A monotheistic God calls this good, this evil. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but he identifies there what I have been arguing about Wordsworth. Wherein lies the good then for Wordsworth? Because there is a sense in which what he just said that he pulls far back enough, he has enough of a godly perspective, or at least what he calls a godly perspective, that it's l the, literally the view from nowhere. No one is capable of taking this vantage point where they have no prejudices at all. I think l Wordsworth, uh, so one of the great enemies or evils seen in the Enlightenment is prejudice. Who would like to be called prejudiced here? Do you want to be called prejudiced? Not a person, no. And, and rightly so, because uh, it would suggest all sorts of negative things about you. And the Enlightenment, when, when, you, when you talk that way, to some degree you're talking the way the Enlightenment talks. Because the Enlightenment has a, uh, wants to eradicate all prejudice, and therefore by eradicating prejudice, to come to a more unified sense of common human purpose, etc. And so we'll talk about, and there's something that Christians are going to agree with this on. We're not going to be, we're not going to care about color or, or race or, or sex or nationality and so forth. Neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor free, or uh, female, Jew or free, right? It's all slave or free, 
all are one in Christ Jesus. So there's a sense of inclusion in that, that sense that this is, this is correct. But the point that uh, a, a contemporary, well, he's dead now, but makes is that the Enlightenment has, does have a prejudice of its own, which it never acknowledges. And the prejudice it has is a prejudice against prejudice. A prejudice against prejudice. Well, what does that mean? It means that it thinks that we can operate in the world without having any views about anything, any fixed views. That's the view of pantheism. The, the distinctions between in good and evil are, are, are fallacious. They ought to disappear because they're prejudices. So it's not without reason or not without, uh, it's not surprising that Hegel should hold this view because he's a product of the Enlightenment. Follows Kant and the whole Enlightenment's prejudice against prejudice. And therefore, the distinction between good and evil, he wants to collapse and, and get above such small-minded things. The problem with this is that by having a human nature, we are prejudiced in the sense that of we're limited by the way we look at things. I'm prejudiced by the fact that I'm in this room and I'm not in another room. Like I, I have a limitation on my perspective and that, that even just the bodily limitations of looking out means that I can't see this and also see everything. I can't look at the world from that vantage point. I'm going to be prejudiced according to the conditions of, of finite human nature. That's a prejudice. And the, uh, the, this era following Wordsworth, following Hegel, is going to want to get beyond finitude. That's what they're trying to do. That's the, that's the core movement here of this spirituality. It's against the physical human nature. It pushes towards a disembodied sense of selfhood, which we share in common with the water and the trees and the birds and the bees and the clouds and pretty much everything. What do we share in common? Well, not a physical nature, a spiritual sense. So it pushes towards a sense of human nature which is no longer embodied at all. Does that make sense? And you will notice that this sense of a spirituality which is opposed to the body, you can think of yourself in a disembodied fashion, is all the rage in our day. In uh, the notion of gender identity, uh, in the notion of uh, the dark green environmental movement, which we'll talk about desecrating the natural world and carbon footprints and so forth and want to see us as part of nature but uh, as a as a problem within the realm of nature, as if we were, there was no distinction between humanity and the rest of nature, except that we're poisoning it. That's that, that initial push or the perspective of pantheism is what leads to most contemporary judgments. This is the religion of our day. And you'll, you'll hear it in chapel worship songs. People, when they talk about themselves, they talk about themselves in disembodied terms. I won't be so cruel as to go through contemporary lyrics and demonstrate it to you, but I could easily do that. As if the spirit of God was a wind blowing in, your, in the room. Language which we get from the book of Acts. Chapter 2, yes, but is it literally meant that way? What do we think when we say things like the Spirit of God or your breath is in me? What does that mean exactly? Your breath is in my lungs. <laughs> it's your breath in my lungs. And I, and I said I wasn't going to do it. I won't do it. What does that mean? It, in Scripture, when the, it, the breath of God is what uh, gives Adam life, that's the breath. Is that the air that we're breathing? Is that what's meant? You're collapsing God's spirit, which is in his person, with the air that you're breathing in your lungs. Is that the same thing? That's, that's just romantic pantheism. That's what that is. 
uncritical. Wordsworth, off my hobby horse here. Wordsworth, Intimations of Immortality. Actually, you know what? I'm going to look at the, uh, I mentioned the uh, prospectus to the excursion. I just wanted to show you that Wordsworth's uh, also thinking in epic terms. We looked at Milton's epic. Uh, this is a later book, a later work than the, in, uh, the Immortality Ode, which we'll spend the most of the time on. And in this, he explicitly refers to Milton's Paradise Lost and the uh, agenda of Paradise Lost. And he will imitate the language, but also deviate from it. And I just wanted to, to show you how he's moving away from Milton's Christian intent towards a pantheistic intention. On man, on nature, and on human life, musing in solitude, I oft perceive fair trains of imagery before me rise, accompanied by feelings of delight, pure, or with no unpleasing sadness mixed. And I am conscious of affecting thoughts and dear remembrances whose presence soothes or elevates the mind, intent to weigh the good or evil of our mortal state. So it's going to weigh the... So now it's the spirit of the poet who's going to determine good and evil. And wherein lies the good and wherein lies the evil. Is it not, has it changed? Has good and evil changed in the created order? Apparently, it can. We're going to take a more spiritual perspective on such matters. The soul is an impulse to herself. So to these emotions, Whence where they come, whether from breath of outward circumstance or from the soul, an impulse to herself. Again, do, do Christians talk about souls being something that we give rise to ourselves? Well, we do if we're Wordsworth and we come to a, an imaginative realization of the goodness of nature, which we're in communion with. That's the means of the new birth. He talked about that last time. Yes, but in Christian theology, the soul is what a human being is already created. You don't become a soul, you are a soul. And we're an embodied soul at that. But Wordsworth's conception of, of human nature is not particularly embodied because it is something that's going to be, uh, would be an impediment from seeing himself in the tree. <laughs> I have a body that means I'm not a tree. I can't identify with a tree, like literally, intellectually, mentally identify with a tree or the water. Anyway, of truth, of grandeur, beauty, love and hope, and melancholy fear subdued by faith of blessed consolations and distress, of moral strength and intellectual power, of the individual mind that keeps her own in violet retirement, subject there of to conscience only, and the law supreme of that intelligence which govern all. I sing, fit audience, let me find though few. Where's he getting this from? Milton, book nine, Paradise Lost. That, la that last line, the quotation, directly from Milton's Paradise Lost. Fit audience, let me find, though few. I'm not going to click on this in case it takes me away from this. So prayed, more gaining than he asked, the bard in holiest mood. Urania, I shall need thy guidance or a greater muse. So now he appeals to a muse, just like you would do in an epic. And what muse does he appeal to? That of astronomy. The heavens. Let me appeal to the heavenly perspective. Is he going to appeal? Is that the same thing as Milton's vision? Well, let's see. Thy guidance or a greater muse of such descend to earth or dwell in highest heaven, for I must dread on shadowy ground, must sink deep and aloft descending breathe in worlds to which the heaven of heavens is but a veil. All strength, all terror, single or in bands that ever was put forth in personal form. We're going to get beyond personal form. We're not going to think of God as he. We're not going to think of him as the father. Let's talk about God in terms that are impersonal. Like we can talk about a, a power or a force. Let's not personalize it. Jehovah with his thunder and the choir of shouting angels and the imperial thrones. I pass them unalarmed. Not chaos, not the darkest pit of lowest Erebus, nor aught of blinder vacancy scooped out by help of dreams 
can breathe such awe and fall as fall upon us when we look into our minds, into the mind of man, my haunt in the main region of my song. So the subject matter of Milton, or rather of Wordsworth's grand epic here, is not the account that Milton gives in Paradise Lost, of heaven, of a paradise lost in a physical place on earth where Adam and Eve have, have bodies and are considered persons, or of God as a personal triune God who interacts with them, but let's get rid of the notion of personhood altogether. And the real God is the, the mind of man, the divinity within us. This becomes the, the new realm of spirituality. It's the whole basis for the modern discipline of psychology and sociology and anthropology. Anthropology just casts this vision back in time. The human sciences. It's an impersonal notion of human nature. It's a conceptualized, it's a rational. It's to think of human nature in abstraction with a literally a view from no, nowhere. That phrase I'm getting from Thomas Nagel, by the way. A view from no, the view from nowhere. That's the Enlightenment's view. Nobody has ever seen the world this way. That's because it's not seen with human eyes at all. It's outside space and time. That's what Wordsworth is doing with us here. And it fits with panentheism. It seems idyllic. It seems utopian. It is utopian. It's trying to bring, bring about a heaven on earth which cannot be finite and cannot be embodied. And you'll go on and on here about this, um, but let me skip over this. Um, but he's echoing here Mil uh, Milton's Paradise Lost in various places. It's useful just to see it as a sort of a manifesto. Uh, 